hello there welcome back to my channel and in this video uh, i will discuss anticoagulants so the first and foremost thing that we are supposed to understand here is that anticoagulants are not fibrinolytic agents the difference between anticoagulants and fibrinolytics is that anticoagulants are going to uh, prevent the formation of the clot okay they might be occurring inside the body they are called as natural or endogenous anticoagulants or they can be also synthesized outside but what is the meaning of fibrinolysis is it is the dissolution after the formation of the clot so once the clot is formed and that clot is dissolved that process is what is called as fibrinolysis and the agents which do that they are called as fibrinolytic agents so this is the difference so don't get confused between anticoagulants and the fibrinolytic agents anticoagulants can be asked as a part of the long essay if they are asking you the coagulation pathway the cascade the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways along with that they can ask you to add a note on the anticoagulants or it can be also asked separately as a short note for six mark or five marks but can be also simply asked as a three mark question so in order to answer this question uh, watch this video till the end so that you will understand what you are supposed to write if this question is asked in your exam So without wasting much time. Let's start anticoagulants The first and foremost thing that we are supposed to understand is the classification of the anticoagulants and The anticoagulants are broadly classified into two varieties the naturally occurring anticoagulants These are the one which are occurring in the body and then the artificial or the synthetic one the artificial or the synthetic one they are further subclassified into two varieties one is called as in vivo another one is called as in vitro okay so in vivo these are the one which can be used on the patients okay in vitro these are the one which are used in the labs while collecting the blood samples so we will go to the artificial or the synthetic later First, let's understand the naturally occurring anticoagulants. The most important is the endothelial surface, which is a naturally occurring anticoagulant. Okay, endothelial surface. Because of this endothelial surface, the blood is not clotting inside the body and the blood is kept in a liquid form. So how does this endothelial surface is going to help in prevention of clotting inside the body first point under the endothelial surface is the smoothness of the endothelial surface the endothelial surface is smooth that is why it is helping in prevention of clotting second thing is the endothelial surface is lined by what is called as glycocalyx even this is also helping in prevention of formation of the clot when the blood is flowing in the blood vessel third and most important is that these endothelial cells they are having surface proteins and these surface proteins are called as thrombomodulins they are called as thrombomodulins so how do these thrombomodulins help in prevention of the clot inside the body is that these thrombomodulins they are going to bind with thrombin they are going to bind with thrombin so this combination of thrombomodulin and thrombin it is going to cause activation of protein c it is going to cause activation of protein c now once the protein c is activated this protein c it is going to inactivate what all it is going to inactivate two very important factors that is factor Five and factor eight. It's going to inactivate factor five and factor eight, which are extremely important for the coagulation. And here, the protein C will also require a cofactor, and that is called as the protein S. So that means thrombin, which is usually a pro-coagulant, it can also act like an anticoagulant. once thrombin comes and binds with thrombomodulin it is going to cause activation of protein c the activated protein c is going to inactivate factor 5 and factor 8 for this it will also require a cofactor which is protein s 
so these three are the factors which are coming under the endothelial factors which are helping in maintaining the blood in the liquid form now apart from the endothelial factors there is one more very important factor which is called as antithrombin or it was previously also called as antithrombin 3 so what's the function of this antithrombin or antithrombin 3 is that it binds with the thrombin and it causes what is called as neutralization or we can also use the word inactivation okay also causes neutralization or inactivation of thrombin it's a very important naturally occurring anticoagulant at last we have our heparin also okay remember that heparin is coming both under natural as well as synthetic because synthetic forms of heparin are also available so in many of your exams they will also ask you mechanism of action of anticoagulants and in that we are supposed to write two very important anticoagulants one is heparin another one is warfarin so first let's understand regarding the heparin heparin is a negatively charged conjugated polysaccharide okay remember that by itself heparin is not having any anticoagulant action or if at all it is having it is having very very little anticoagulant action so how does then heparin acts very important point heparin is going to combine with the antithrombin which i had mentioned you just now and once heparin combines with the antithrombin it is going to activate it and we all know what the antithrombin does antithrombin is going to bind with the thrombin and it is going to cause neutralization and inactivation of thrombin a very very important point as far as your exams are concerned so the binding of heparin with antithrombin not only inactivates thrombin but it also inactivates very importantly factor 10 apart from that it can also inactivate factor 9 factor 11 as well as factor 12 okay and inside the body heparin is secreted from two very important cells one is called as the mast cells very very important and the second one is the base of it so this is how the heparin is going to act now coming to the synthetic anticoagulants and are also called as artificial anticoagulants in that first we will cover the one which are used in vivo that is which we use on the patients and in that again the first one is heparin it is very very commonly used anticoagulants on the patients from where it is derived it is derived from porcin intestinal mucosa and heparin can be given both subcutaneously or it can be also administered intravenously remember heparin is never given orally okay when it is given subcutaneously whenever we require it for prophylaxis when it is given intravenously whenever we require it for treatment purposes next artificially occurring or synthetic anticoagulant after heparin is warfarin this belongs to a group of drugs which are called as coumarins okay remember that i told you that heparin cannot be given orally it can be only given by subcutaneous route or it can be given intravenously so warfarin is a drug which we can use orally that's why these group of drugs are also called as oral anticoagulants now let's understand its mechanism of action so we all know that vitamin k is very important for the process of coagulation why it is very important because there are vitamin k dependent factors what are those factor 2 factor 7 factor 9 and factor 10 so these vitamin k dependent clotting factors are produced only when vitamin k is activated so here when i say activated i mean a process which is called as gamma carboxylation okay it is called as gamma carboxylation so for the activation of vitamin k we need an enzyme which is called as vitamin k epoxide reductase complex so what does our warfarin does is it is going to inhibit this enzyme so once this enzyme is inhibited activated vitamin k is not formed and when there is no activated vitamin k there is no formation of factor 2 factor 7 and factor 10 
So when all these factors are not present in the coagulation cascade, the coagulation process is not going to occur. One very important thing as doctors we have to remember here is that warfarin is a teratogenic agent that means if we give warfarin during pregnancy it can result in so many congenital anomalies so warfarin should never be given during pregnancy the drug of choice if at all we need an anticoagulant during pregnancy is always heparin okay so this is how is the mechanism of action of warfarin and heparin so where these anticoagulants are asked if at all it's a short note it's always good to add this slide these are used in so many conditions like DVT that is deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, angina pectoris and also prior to, during and even after the vascular surgeries. Now coming to the synthetic drugs which are used in vitro. These are the one which are used in the laboratories during the collection of the blood because when I collect the blood, I don't want the blood to clot. So many of these or majority of these they are going to act by inactivation of the calcium ions because we know that calcium is very important for the coagulation to occur so they are going to cause inactivation of the calcium so few of the uh, anticoagulants which are used in the lab we have to know we have to mug up these things in order for us to complete the answer the first one is called as edta it is nothing but ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Second one is trisodium citrate. Next is called as double oxalate. This double oxalate is a mixture of ammonium oxalate and potassium oxalate. It is in the ratio of 3 is to 2. Next one is sodium fluoride. It is the most commonly used anticoagulant when I have to uh, store the blood in the blood bank. So it is used for storing of the blood. We can also use the salts of heparin and two more one is called as acd acd is nothing but acid citrate dextrose and cpda is nothing but citrate phosphate dextrose adenine so these are the list of few of the uh, in vitro synthetic anticoagulants which are used in the laboratory during collection of the blood sample